Good police work or intimidation? That's the question some in the African-American community of Baymanette are asking about some of the crime-fighting efforts in their city. News 5's Debbie Williams went this looking is for 2018, answers Paul. on the Baldwin County Beat. The train tracks here in Baymanette, a dividing line in the city that some say on the one side is law enforcement, on the other is harassment. A Baymanette police cruiser patrols a neighborhood. We ain't never seen this go on until... We got the new um, chief going around here. Fearful of retaliation, this woman didn't want to reveal her identity. Everywhere we go in our community to either uh, do anything, it's always police on every corner. And it's, it's just getting um, out of hand. I mean, we can't do anything. She says cameras are up in neighborhoods off Hickory Street and the Douglasville community and Clay Street. We just feel like we're being violated. Police called the one block of Hickory Street monitored. Chief Al Tolbert makes no apologies. We have received some complaints, um, but the praise that we've received from the law-abiding citizens and residents in these areas have outweighed the negative complaints tremendously. Larry Naves grew up in Douglasville and has watched his boyhood neighborhood change. It's not a harassment. This should have been patrolled down here a long time ago. And it may be working. Crime figures for last month are down 25% compared to the same time last year. Tolbert says that's a good start. We're going to keep at it and uh, continue what we've been doing. On the Baldwin County Beat and Baymanette, Debbie Williams, WKRG News 5. Less than 30 minutes north of Birmingham sits the small town of Brookside, Alabama. It's a former mining town with no stoplights, no retail stores other than the Dollar General, and no major crimes. A stretch of Interstate 22 runs directly through Brookside, and the town has a lot of cops to police it. Brookside is only about three miles long and has just over 1,200 residents. But the police here, they feel the need for at least three SWAT vehicles. Not only that, they also have a tank, which looks brand new. According to the local media outlet AL.com, between 2018 and 2020, under Brookside Police Chief Mike Jones, income from fees and forfeitures increased by 640 percent. The outlet says the money amounts to half of the town's total income, or roughly 1.2 million dollars. A gray vehicle in a driveway on Lower Street in Baymanette. That's where Otis French Jr. pulled over for a faulty blinker and the same yard where he would eventually lose his life. It's a really tough thing to know that this family is currently grieving and we're trying to figure out why. You know, we want to know how we ended up there. So that interview looked like a hostage video. If you go back and watch Andre's interview with the press, unbelievable. How did this happen? Why did it happen? Um, what's the background? And, you know, how do we move forward from this? What they believe so far, the officer was pushed to the ground after the traffic stop. French ran away. The officer catches up to him and uses his taser, but it's not effective. Then another physical fight, and French gets the taser and tases the officer multiple times. And that's when the police officer shot him. Having someone get the taser certainly poses a huge problem for that officer if he were to become incapacitated with a firearm, his vehicle's out there with other firearms. So, you know, it's a really dangerous situation. The Baldwin County Major Crimes Task Force made up of investigators from several agencies is conducting the investigation. They say it won't be quick, but it will be thorough. Between, you know, recovered shell casings, you know, how many rounds I believe are actually fired from the officer's weapon, body camera footage, witnesses, uh, you name it. Uh, there's actually maybe another source for video out there. So we have to review all those things and come back with a definitive answer. My name is Joshua Brown. Uh, I'm right here in Baymanette, Alabama. We organized the Baymanette Justice League in response to the killing of Otis French Jr. We want to make sure that we want transparency and justice for the family. We don't want to let this issue die down. We want to keep this issue forefront. And uh, where are you from? That kind of place. <laughs> My name is Sam White. I'm from Raymond, Alabama. I currently reside and live in Decatur, Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. You were here to MC the event? Well, not to MC. I was one of, one of the speakers for uh, today's event. Yeah. In 2020, the U.S. Census.
census, took a poll, took a survey. They registered 8,107 people in the city of Maymanac. Yeah. In that same year, there was an election. Only 865 people out of 5,000 registered went and voted. So today we want to have a reminder that if you want change in this town, if you don't like who's ever running things in this town, use that power that we all have. And you vote. So many people have died for the right to vote. Let's not let our brother and our cousin and our friend have died in vain. He said visiting, but this is home. This is home. It's important that I be here because still got four nephews here, and any one of them could have been OJ. Still got a mama who lives here, a brother who lives here, a sister who lives here. And I'm always here. I want to say to my cousin and classmate Tamara that our heart, our really youth with Mr. Otis Sr., Dr. Phyllis, the entire French family, our prayers remain with you. According to a press release from the Baymanet Police Department, the officer within Baymanet PD conducted a traffic stop on Lower Street. Stopped the vehicle that Otis Prince Jr. was driving because of an equipment malfunction. The officer asked Otis French Jr. to exit the vehicle so the officer could show him the equipment violation and issue Mr. French a warning for the violation. The police department says that their preliminary investigation revealed that once Mr. French exited the vehicle, he would not comply with the officer's instructions. So some things already aren't adding up for me. Hmm. What instructions? He wasn't under arrest. He wasn't being held in custody. He wasn't being detained. Seems like community needs some answers. What lawful instructions did he not comply with that led to his death? See, no one should distort what we are doing here today. We're not being provocative because we ask or demand transparency or accountability. In fact, there was Frederick Douglass who told us power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. So I want to encourage all of the people who gathered here today to continue to exercise your First Amendment rights of freedom and speech and freedom of assembly. There are some folks who think our gathering here today is threatening. Uh -huh. And I say, good, let them think that. Yeah. I, there are even some religious leaders who think we ought to just go home and pray. And yes, you ought to pray. But you ought to do more than pray. You see, in Exodus, the Bible says that the Israelites groaned under their oppression and they cried out to, to their God and their cry rose up to God. And God looked upon them and God took notice of them. Together they lifted a collective voice in lamentation about an unjust system. We are gathered here at this courthouse today. So Paul, unmute your mic and uh, we'll just let this run in the background.
those from the county and all of those. Yes, sir. All right. And I even got for the felon the information they need to get their voting rights back. I'm going to read what's the narrative. Details released by law enforcement can drive perception by Scott Johnson. Very good article. And land, you're up. Can you, can you hang in there for it? Yeah. We're nearly 200 protesters gathered outside the Baldwin County Courthouse last Thursday. Organizers sought to establish a counter-narrative for what precipitated the shooting death of Otis O.J. French Jr. by a Baymanette police officer. An official release by the Baldwin County Major Crimes Unit portrays French as escalating the altercation that would ultimately cost him his life after he was pulled over on Lower Street in the Douglasville community of Baymanette Saturday morning, August 20th, for an equipment violation. I should say this was at 10.30 in the morning, not 3 o'clock in the morning or 2.30 in the morning. 10.30 right. in the morning. In his neighborhood. The 32-year-old subject was reportedly asked to exit the vehicle so the officer could show him a broken taillight. French reportedly came became combative once outside of the vehicle, sparking a physical struggle with a veteran Baymanette police officer. French allegedly pushed the officer to the ground and attempted to run. So, Paul, right here at this point of the story, nobody's dead. We got his car. They know who he is. They we, have his tag number. We, we, yeah. So, so anyway, French allegedly pushed the officer to the ground and attempted to run. The officials say the officer caught up and attempted to use a stun gun on him but it was ineffective, and a second fight ensued. The official account states French wrestled the stun gun out of the officer's grip and began to use it against him. That stun gun was reportedly being used until the officer shot French, killing him. During the September 1st protest, French's family and the newly formed Baymanette Justice League claimed the initial report was vague, misleading, and mischaracterized French. It's senseless. O.J. wasn't a thug. O.J. wasn't a gangster. He was quiet. He stuck to himself. Jeremy Boone, one of French's longtime friends, said. Boone and French was the son of... Boone said French was the son of Otis and Phyllis French. And that's Dr. Phyllis French. She works for the Bowen County School Board <laughs> as a reading instructor. Or as the head of all the reading instructors. I think that's right. Um, and a great, he's, so French was a 2008 graduate of Ball County High School where he played football and excelled academically. He was an Alabama A&M graduate who earned a degree in marketing in 2014. Joshua Brown, one of the uh, Baymanette Justice League organizers, said the police account makes no sense knowing French's character. He described French as being well-read, devoted to his faith, and a rising musician who published albums under his artist name, The Juice. Those songs were being played during the demonstration at the Baymanette Courthouse Square. So that music that you heard while uh, we yeah. were, were uh, watching that protest earlier, that was actually his original music. We just want transparency. We want justice. We want a thorough investigation, and we'll see where everything lies, Brown said. He said the Justice League is calling for investigators to provide French's family with more details about the incident, noting authorities haven't even disclosed the name of the officer who killed their son. That officer is currently on paid administrative leave as the investigation takes place. Um, Brown acknowledged, the, sir. I said, or the history of the officer. Hmm. Cause I think he came from another department five years ago. Uh, uh, and I'd like to know why he left the other department. 
Also, Harry, in that article you just read, you mentioned that about the uh, stun gun. Well, he said that he already tried it and it was ineffective. And now he's now they're saying that when French got it in his hands, it was working. So, so that's a little confusing, too. Brown acknowledged some media outlets have reported on French's arrest history, which, according to court documents, included charges of attempting to elude law enforcement and resisting arrest in March 2016. However, the state dismissed those charges three months later. So, like they like like his family said, there's no drugs, there's no armed nothing. robbery, there's no nothing. You know, high speed chases. Brown and says, I, and I think Harry that you and I have been predicting this for years. Oh, this was this was totally predictable given how right. the jackbooted thug tactics that Chief Tolbert brought over from the sheriff's department. He learned from the best. Brown said there were extenu- extenuating circumstances involved in that incident and reporting on it was unfair, noting the respective officer's history is not under the same scrutiny as he remains unidentified. Mm-hmm. The Reverend Sam White, who graduated from Bowell County High School with French's older sister, Tamara, spoke during the event on behalf of the family and said there needs to be transparency in the investigation. Once Mr. French exited the vehicle, he would not comply with the officer's instructions, said White, reading from the official report. Some things here aren't already aren't adding up for me. What instructions? He wasn't under arrest. He wasn't being held in custody. It seems like the community needs some answers. White claims the incident is indicative of the Baymanet Police Department's disproportionately targeting black and brown people and aggressively pr- pr- patrolling communities of color. Now, we saw the 2018 uh, report where they put web cameras on all of the street signs down there in right. Douglasville, right? Right. And you heard what Tolbert said, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. Right. And, and, and you're talking about a very small community here. During an initial press conference on August 22nd, Bowen County Major Crimes Unit Commander Andre Reed, that that's the uh, the hostage video that we just watched, uh, right. promised a thorough and in, independent investigation. He said the Bowen County Major Crimes Unit generally does not name the officers during the investigations to respect everyone's privacy. Yeah, right. Except he works for the public, and he really doesn't have the same privacy rights that an, a private individual would. He also said body cam footage would not be released as it is evidence. He said it could be manipulated publicly and bias a grand jury tasked with determining if the officer was justified in the shooting. He said the Baltimore County Major Crimes Unit leaves it up to the individual agencies whether or not to release the footage after an investigation closes. Reed and the did, grand jury and the grand jury list mentioned everybody is totally secret, so you don't know what the hell they're telling the grand jury. Okay, so this is the important part that everybody needs to listen up for. Reed did not respect re- respond to a request for comment on this story. The Baldwin County Major Crimes Unit consists of Baymanette Police <laughs> Chief Al Tombert, who is currently the chairman, Robertsdale Police Chief Brad Kendrick. Sheriff Huey House Mack of the Bond County Sheriff's Office, Gulf Shores Police Chief Edward Delmore, and we're going to watch a video with that Yankee in it in a minute. Daphne Police Chief David Carpenter, the dude with the little mustache, he looks like a, a villain from a 1920 silent film, and Foley Police Chief Thurston Bullock. Um, the agency is tasked with reviewing the actions of officers working for its member organizations. They just keep adding things to what the major crimes unit was put together for. Right. And major crimes is Hoss Mack and a bunch of police chiefs, all of the municipalities of Baldwin County, all associates and friends of the police. Okay. So, so let me explain this to people. There are task force (laughs) created all the time. And all that means is we, we put a notation in the file. So we know who to bill the hours to, right? Right. Okay. So this major crimes unit, which is a standing organization, which is supposed to be completely independent, these are guys that all went to this cop's wedding and stuff. This is not independent. It's the furthest thing from independent. Right. So so let's get into the real part of the story here, setting narratives. While what actually happened August 20th on Lower Street will remain unclear for now, calls for accountability from law enforcement's handling of deadly force incidents and high-profile cases are not new, especially not in Baldwin County. 
Being the authoritative source for information in these incidents gives agencies an inherent benefit in establishing narratives from their perspective, sometimes leading to facts being released that can skew public opinion in law enforcement's favor and against that of defendants, or in this case, a potential victim. Mm -hmm. Let's not call Otis French a defendant just yet. Over the last several years, the ability of agencies to frame self-serving accounts has caused nationwide alarm. The most brazen example was seen earlier this year in the aftermath of the mass shooting at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas on May 24th when a teenager gunned down 19 children and two teachers at the school. Key details and facts about the incident flipped on their heads almost daily as the incident was scrutinized under a microscope by the media and state and federal authorities. Local law enforcement initially had been praised for their immediate response to the school, but that praise quickly walked back as grim revelations began to show that a large group of heavily armed officers waited in a school hallway for more than an hour as gunshots continued to ring out from a classroom where the shooter had, quote, barricaded himself. Texas Governor Greg Abbott said he was misled about the incident when he offered initial praise to local authorities. Clark Neely, a policy scholar with the Cato Institute and Public Institute lawyer for more than 20 years, said while, while he has seen more abuses than he can count, he, believe, he believes nefarious, conscious campaigns by law enforcement to, to sway public per, perception are rare. That is total bunk, Paul Rip. <laughs> this guy needs to go work somewhere else because he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Instead, he believes issues generally happen as agency agencies operate as they are intended, meaning officials will default to framing public information in a way to avoid undermining or self-incriminating the department. I think it is very common to want to tell your side of the case, Neely said. So that's the point. We don't know La. anything about this Otis French incident except what the major crimes unit through Andre Reed has told us. And, oh, by the way, Andre Reed is the official spokesperson for the Baldwin County Sheriff's Department. Oh, you know, and Mr. Andre Reed, uh, Mr. Andre Reed was also uh... – involved in the Robert Yates case and the eviction of Mr. Yates, where they shot 114 rounds through a mobile trailer, ended up tailor tearing the trailer completely apart. And the man was shot numerous times with some of the police during this attack on the trailer, screaming, let's go in and kill him. So uh, Mr. Reed was there at that time. Uh, that was another case. And then, you know, we could go to the next case, which is Jonathan Victor. And Mr. Victor, who was shot on I-10, who had a fanny pack. He didn't even have a weapon. And he was killed. So I know you've got some slides and we'll go through them. But these are the cases that Harry and I have been talking about for years. And we get deflected to this major crimes thing, which is actually major cover up I don't, I don't want to i don't want to beat this down too much but i do want to watch this real quick okay very disturbing portrayal of what was going on in the hallway the families certainly are extremely upset anderson over how this came out the leak uh, they were expecting this to come out at some point that they were going to be able to view this in an organized uh, fashion but i think off the top it's important to know how upset the family members are so here's the raw video Crashes the truck. Two people go over there. They get shot at. They run away. Now, they took out all the children screaming from that they dubbed it out. Right. The biggest thing here is surveillance, film, video. You ready for it? Yep. 1136. These are the three guys that supposedly went into the room.
All this time, man. Check your phone. Yeah. Now see, they're they're shot, so they dubbed it out. Oh. Yep. Now at that point, they should have just gone in. Yep. Forty-eight minutes later. So this just gives you a prime example of what, of how distorted the facts could be on the O.J. French case. Good heavens, look at this. Being, uh, and it's it, it, Director Andrew. When I, uh, yeah, I want to bring in uh, senior, <clears throat> CNN senior law enforcement analyst and former FBI deputy director Andrew McCabe. Andrew, what is your reaction to, to seeing this video? Not the full surveillance video, which went on for 77 minutes. It, it does show the officers just waiting. You see ballistic shields being laid on the ground. You see Now, Paul. Yeah. The important thing to remember about this is that the Texas Rangers got on national television and told us this big, long story about how all this happened. Right. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Reminds me of the major crimes unit. Right. So um, so let's continue. Uh, they, they, they then talk a good bit about the George Floyd incident and how that was covered up recipe for accountability is there a straightforward solution for this seamlessly unchecked power to influence public perception and facts probably not according to neely despite the easy potential for abuses neely said agencies have a legitimate duty to communicate with the public about situations they are involved in he said implementing blanket rules that prevent or limit authorities providing preliminary information would do much more harm than good Neely said the only workable solution to this problem is moral integrity on the part of law enforcement and for citizens and elected officials to hold those agencies accountable when they abuse this authority. Neely noted, though, there needed, there need, there's a need for accountability is more aspirational in many cases than it is realistic. It's plain <clears throat> that it is an uphill battle to audit and sue government officials. Without adequate access to public records and pathways through the court system, Neely said, this accountability can often seem impossible, which, of course, it is. Neely said the public needs robust open records law to obtain and scrutinize resources, such as body camera footage, which is integral in reviewing officer conduct. However, Which we're public, paying for, which the taxpayers are paying for. However, when the public attempts to obtain these records, they are often met with resistance or flat-out denied. Neely said... There should be a general public expectation that footage is made available at the earliest opportunity. He argues there should be a high standard for what footage is allowed to be withheld from the public and agencies should carry the burden of proof if they argue it should be kept confidential. Officers are agents acting on behalf as our employees. The footage belongs to us, not to them, he said. The arguments for withholding body cams are generally self-serving, and unpersuasive. Paul Irvin, the president of the Alabama Chief Association of Chiefs of Police, and here we the, go, and the chief of police of Leeds, said the public should be generally trusting of <laughs> of official <laughs> accounts by law enforcement. There are specific standards for law enforcement. So they go through rigorous training and aptitude tests. They're not felons. Well, not that we know of. Uh, they should uh, be more. Uh, trustworthy, Irwin said. He noted the public can file complaints if they believe there are inaccuracies with f- official reports. <laughs> oh, my God. Where does yeah. this guy live? I don't Maryland? know. File your complaint with the major Not in Alabama, unit. dude. Come down here. Yeah, really. Where are you? He explained body cameras uh, have become an essential tool in internal reviews to monitor officers' behavior. 
If the information in official reports are proven inaccurate, Irwin said, agencies should have the integrity to correct the record. If there is malice or negligence <laughs> involving law enforcement agencies or apt enough to administratively address problems in their own ranks, he said. Irwin noted that there are multiple layers of authority among state and federal agencies to provide accountability and dismiss the notion that these departments will cover for one another. My Irwin God. believes body cam footage can contain sensitive material and shouldn't be made available immediately available to the press. However, he said he doesn't see any conflict with obliging media outlets and records requests after investigations conclude. Okay, so that's Paul, a key point. That's a key point. The investigation could go on for years. So, shooting stance and ketamine. I give you two guesses what this is about. Oh my goodness! Unfortunately, in the state of Alabama, law enforcement agencies, uh, law enforcement is under no obligation to release body cam footage even after a case is resolved. Per last year's Alabama Supreme Court decision in Lanyap versus Mac, body right. cam recordings are regarded as investigative materials and exempt from the state's Open Records Act. My so God. right here, people, the corruption in Baldwin County is now state law. Yeah. And you're paying for it. Right. We're all paying for it. We're all paying our tax this, this dollars. This decision was made right here in Baldwin County by one yep. of our circuit court judges, and it went up, and only one Supreme Court justice re- wrote a compelling dissent. And uh, I hate to say I've never supported Justice Parker, but... He has my vote from here to the grave. Um, Lanyap's lawsuit against Bowen County Sheriff Mack stemmed from a deputy-involved shooting in May 2017 where it appears key facts presented to the Bowen County Grand Jury and disseminated to the public materially misrepresented the incident. This is the Jonathan Victor case. After crashing his vehicle... Along the muddy side of Interstate 10 on May 12, 2017, Jonathan Victor, 35, of of Louisiana, was acting erratically and refused aid from bystanders. Witnesses called 911 reporting he was bloody and may have been armed with a weapon. May have been armed with a weapon. Faced with the same lack of cooperation, responding firefighters called for assistance from the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office, repeating that Victor was possibly armed. When Deputy Matt Hornaday arrived on the scene, now, let me let me set the picture for y'all. He's eating lunch at Mama Lou's in Robertsdale when the call comes in. He's the sharpshooter for the SWAT team. So he gets in his vehicle and drives up 59 and across I-10 to the incident site. Gets Which out with a weapon, minutes. gives instructions to this guy. He doesn't comply, and he gets shot. We're going to watch it. When Deputy Matt Hornaday arrived on the scene, he armed himself with his service rifle and took a defensive position behind a fire truck about 30 feet from Victor's vehicle. Hornaday attempted to establish communication with Victor by yelling commands. Victor eventually emerged from his car holding two objects in his hands after failing to concede to Hornady's demands to drop the items Hornady shot Victor four times Victor was treated on the scene airlifted resuscitated as many as five times and died eight hours later in the hospital now I don't know how a sharpshooter shoots you from seven yards it's 21 feet four times and you suffer through eight hours of being re- resuscitated and all that and other you stuff. think and you think he has a gun and you can't see it from 21 feet despite no weapons being found on the scene authorities maintain in the media they are still investigating whether or not Victor had a weapon it wasn't God. until three days later that Mac revealed Victor was unarmed. Even then, Mac continued to say that Victor was holding two objects while declining to identify what they were. They were later revealed to be a jacket and a fanny pack. After a grand jury ruled not to press charges against Hornaday in October 2017, the Major Crimes Unit held a press conference and Mac presented two minutes of selected portions of Hornaday's body cam footage and a witness cell phone recording of the incident. Aside from showing Victor's failure to comply with demands, the public was given little information about the circumstances that led up to the shooting. And if you read the original article they read about this, the question was, 
who decided Jonathan Victor was a threat to anybody? Right. Nobody's right. taking accountability for that. In fact, yet. in fact, Harry, in one of those articles that uh, wrote about where the uh, first responders, the emergency ambulance, and so on and so forth, were corresponding with each other on the air, warning their drivers that the sheriff's department was on the scene, and you know how they are about bringing their guns out, and here they are warning the first responders going to the scene about the sheriff's department, not. Jonathan Victor. Right. You better get about 200 yards back or you might get hit by a stray bullets. What I've been telling my people on the ambulance during the same press conference, Baldwin County district attorney, Bob Wilters and Gulf Shores police chief, Ed Delmore told reporters that the narcotic ketamine had been found in Victor's toxicology report. And the drug was often abused. Every oh. news outlet reported the fact at the time but none were informed that the drug had been administered to the victim by paramedics at the scene after Victor had been shot. Man, oh man, oh man. How many times do they screw around with corner reports or innuendo or insinuating, you know, things that are just totally wrong, and then there's no accountability on their behalf whatsoever, none. And that's two cases. That's Victor and Yates. And then we still had the uh, sheriff's deputy chase the people down I-10 the wrong way where five people lost their lives and nothing resulted from that, even though the chase was going the wrong way down and it violated all types of sheriff policies. This is the witness video from the bystander's cell phone. It's a Hispanic couple. Now, here comes Victor out of the car. You see he's got something in his hands, right? He's in a shooter stance. Using his fingers. You see that? I can't see that. My God, man. Are you kidding me? This is the way they handled this? Wow. I sure as hell don't see anything that indicates a gun to me. No, nope, keep watching. He's mimicking them. He's got about five seconds to live. Damn. Oh, that's on shit. that's on automatic. Shit. Now they all run up there. Everybody on I tens watching this. Wake up, people. Wake up. Mami, el tipo está loco para la pinga. Se le va a decir, le voy a meter un balazo a uno aquí. Es que estoy nervioso porque nos estuvo apuntando para acá. So, what do you think about that one, Mr. Rip? It's happening all over the country. It just seems like Baldwin County gets away with it over and over and over and over again. Now, what I'm predicting is that sooner or later, the Baldwin County Commission is going to have to write a multi, multi, multi million dollar check to somebody, maybe Mr. O.J. French's family, for this type of conduct, which continues to go on and then is covered up by the major crimes unit. These cases should be held, should be investigated by outside county resources. Okay. And there's a pattern of false information that comes out, and I see you're going to hit another case right I now. Am. Go I'm, ahead. So, Bone County, I'm going to finish this one first. Bone County Sheriff's Office official narrative was Victor emerged from the vehicle and took an aggressive shooter stance, punching out his hands. Hornady claims he believed the jacket was concealing a firearm. The sheriff's 
Department's legal counsel has argued Victor was attempting suicide by cop. Officials also claim there were cuts on Victor's wrist, inferring he may have been suicidal. Boy. What, so what do you reckon when you get shot four times that you do the funky chicken on the ground and it might cause some scratches on your body? Well, I mean, it's always the victim. You know, it's the, the let's talk about the victim, not who's... Uh, uh, uh. In April 2021, court order denied Hunter Day and Mac qualified immunity from a wrongful death lawsuit. U.S. District Court Judge William Cassidy found Victor had taken no shooter stance. And a reasonable person would ha- would not have thought the items in his hands were concealing a weapon. Thank An appeal you. by the Bowen County Sheriff's Office on uh, Cassidy's ruling is pending. So let's talk a little bit about qualified immunity. While barriers are, are preventing the public from obtaining records, there are also protections such as qualified immunity. i got to put these glasses back on. Let's come to that. Uh, do you... <laughs> The U.S.'s qualified immunity doctrine shields government officials from liability as long as their conduct violates no, quote, clearly established constitutional rights. Patrick Jacoby is a lawyer with the Institute for Justice in Arlington, Virginia, a base civil liberties law firm. He said qualified immunity was established by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1982 with the intent to enable government officials to conduct the public's works without the risk of being bankrupted by civil actions. However, Jacomi also says the doctrine is deeply flawed and there is a growing consensus it should be remanded. Okay, let me give you an example. If you are a police officer in California and you go on a drug raid, and while you're on that drug raid, you steal a million dollars from the drug dealer, that drug dealer can sue you for that million dollars. Because it's clearly established law in California that that is illegal. Guess where it's not clearly established? <laughs> if that same thing happened to you in the in in Alabama, uh, Florida, or Georgia, our federal circuit doesn't recognize that as clearly established law. So they just be able to steal your million dollars. That's how screwed up it is. It's by district clearly established law. Okay, so mm-hmm. so not only do you have to worry, well, you know, can I sue them? Is, d- did they violate my federal rights in the right jurisdiction? Think about how stupid that is. It's supposed to be a federal right, right? You, you understand that. Yeah, right. Yeah. So how could it be selective from place to place? Uh, for one, Jacoby said there's substantial research showing even in cases where qualified immunity is, is denied, it is the respective government agencies that covers monetary damages, not it, not the employee, thus supplanting the intent of the doctrine. Qualified immunity is also brought on, the, on, uh, on a circular rational under its clearly established rights standard, Jacoby said. He said clearly established means plaintiffs, must point to past appellate rulings or opinions in the same jurisdiction where the court has declined qualified immunity. If there is no precedent, then immunity is the default regardless of of whether or not the actions were illegal. If an officer stole money during a search warrant, but there is no case law establishing a precedent that constitutional rights were violated, they'd be considered immune. (laughs) <laughs> the issue with using case law to determine clearly yeah. established rights is that two cases are never the same, and the defense lawyers are often successful in God arguing almighty. respective cases are incompatible. Irwin, president of the Alabama Association of Chiefs of Police, defined qualified immunity, saying it was an essential part of empowering law enforcement to do their jobs without hesitation. The last thing the state needs are officers who are not confident in doing their job because they think they'll be prosecuted, he said. So let's have it to where they got the opinion that they can do anything and they won't be prosecuted. If we just do what we're supposed to do, qualified immunity protects us. If we're doing something Duh. that's against policy, we can lose that immunity. All right, I'm kind of done with that. So let's, uh, um, let's move on to the blood spatter and surveillance. So on the screen, you see... Uh, former Mobile County Commissioner Steve Nodine in a Facebook picture with the woman he was accused of shooting in the head in cold blood 
and then leaving her residence in haste because he's married to someone else at the time. Now, what year was that, Harry? Uh, 2010. So I'm going to read Ten. it to you. Form, so the blood splatter and surveillance. Former Mobile County Commissioner Steve Nodine said civil immunity has shielded Baldwin County law enforcement and prosecutors from accountability for what he claims was a botched and politically driven prosecution. On May 9, 2010, officer found Nodine's longtime girlfriend and real estate agent, Angel Downs, deceased at the end of her driveway on West Fort Morgan Road, a 9 millimeter pistol found by her side. Nodine was seen leaving the area in a red county-owned pickup truck. So he's in the county-issued pickup truck. However, mm -hmm. as the case unfolded, it appeared investigators either knew or should have known uh, some early evidence released publicly that supported the narratives of Nodine's guilt turned out to be unsubstantiated or factually incorrect. Well, ding my dong, Paul Rip. Can you believe that? Yep, that sounds like the Murray Lawrence uh, wrongful conviction case. Sounds like uh, about five others we're going to talk about. In 2012, right. Nodine sued Mack and former Baldwin County District Attorney Judy Newcomb in federal court for malicious prosecution, mishandling evidence, and intentional infliction of emotional distress. Couldn't agree with you more. However, he told Lanyap the lawsuit was dismissed due to officials being immune from civil actions. Despite significant evidence and early handling of the investigation supporting the cause of death as suicide, Newcomb decided to take the the, ca the case to make the case a murder investigation. According to court testimony, investigators worked overtime to have an investigation concluded in 15 days, just in time for Newcomb to present the results to the Baldwin County Grand Jury later the same month. Investigations typically span several months prior to be to being presented in such a setting. Regardless, the indictment was successful and no dime was charged with murder and stalking. The timing also fell one week before the 2010 Republican primary election for Bowen County District Attorney. No dime Duh. attorney at the time argued the crowded primary was the driving factor in New Newcomb pursuing a murder charge so quickly. Also featured during that 15-day window from Down's death to No Dime's indictment was a May 19, 2010 press conference where sheriff's officials released bombshell claims that investigators had potentially damning evidence against Nodine, blood residue, surveillance footage, and an empty shell casing, all of which later proved <laughs> false. All of it. All of it pro proved false. Ten you days, see a pattern here? Ten days a into the investigation, the Ball County Sheriff's Office spokesman told reporters, stains consistent with blood were found in Nodine's vehicle. These claim so Nodine claims that whatever if she shot herself at the end of the driveway, he did it and she didn't know it. He was leaving and she shot herself as he drove away. What they're saying is they found blood inside the truck, which totally blows his narrative up, right, Paul? Right. They right. said they found blood in his truck. These claims were publicized despite a presumptive test performed by local law enforcement being negative and the Department of Forensic Science confirming earlier that same day the stains were, in fact, not blood. It wasn't until after an, in an indictment that Newcomb finally revealed the stains were not blood. Mac wow. also made headlines on May 19th telling report reporters authorities were in possession of a hard drive that may have captured the moment Downs lost her life. This information was delivered to local media despite the fact that investigators had confirmed within days of the incident that security cameras from Downs' condominium complex were not operable for some time before her death. Authorities also informed reporters a spent forty caliber shell casing had been found in Nodine's truck. This was uh, despite investigators concluding almost from the beginning that the 9 millimeter found at the scene had been used uh, in Down's death. And wow. For, for the newbies out there, a 9 millimeter will not fire a forty caliber shell. Nope. Once it's out there and once they say it, there's no way to get it back, Nodine said. You never gain your reputation back. Nodine's case was before a circuit judge by December 2010, just in time for the to be prosecuted by Newcomb before she left office. She had, fin 
She had finished third among four candidates in the primary earlier that year. A mistrial was declared in a 9-3 jury deadlock. A second trial was moved out of Bowen County Circuit Court and set to take place in Dothan in 2012. Prior to the trial taking place, Nodine was successfully able to negotiate a guilty plea to lesser charges of, of misdemeanor domestic harassment and perjury. The murder and stalking charges were abandoned. Ultimately, Nodine spent two years in federal prison during his prosecution on an unrelated gun charge and served two years in Baldwin County custody on later charges. Sheriff Mack did not respond to requests for comment about the story. So, um, I think that... And this is the exact same thing that they did again. Let me bring it up. The Murray Lawrence wrongful conviction where the uh, deceased was... uh, medical examiner said that it was a strangulation and yet the sheriff's department and the prosecution said it was a gunshot, but there was no evidence of the gunshot and the man was convicted and still in jail to today. So, um, I don't know if you caught this or not, but, uh, prior to the trial, uh, let's see, he negotiated a guilty plea, but th- this, this other thing about the, the federal prison thing. So, it was all hands on deck, including the feds. So what they did was he admitted to being addicted to prescription painkillers and also having a 9 millimeter pistol in his possession during that time. So he was right. guilty of being a drug user in possession of a firearm. Now, right. boy, they that's had to really strange. dig deep to find that one. In the criminal I was going to say, that's a far stretch from murder. And look how many times they use that in federal court on people prior to them being prosecuted in state court. It 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 whittles away your, your defenses. Right. All right, so let's just listen to a little bit of this story. Nodine and Angel Downs in what looks like a happier time. She was somebody I loved very much. In his first sit-down interview since being charged with her murder, the former Mobile County Commissioner denied killing his mistress and insists he was not there when she was shot. Neighbors put you there at the scene in the neighborhood, and we heard that testimony in the first trial. The neighbors said they heard a gunshot, then they saw your county truck Mm -hmm. fleeing, and some said speeding out of the neighborhood. If you're doing 15 miles miles an hour in that area you were speeding i mean and I were think you the there were you there when angel was no, shot absolutely not i had uh, absolutely no inkling whatsoever i mean this is in between us but the affair was a focal point of the first murder trial a trial nodine calls politically motivated as the ex-commissioner waits to find out whether there will be a second trial he is now demanding an apology from the prosecutor she owes an apology to the Downs family and certainly to Kimberly and Christopher Nodine. Uh, I think she maliciously prosecuted this case uh, to better her own political career. Do you owe apologies to the Downs family and to your own family? Well, I mean, there's no doubt I owe an apology for carrying on uh, as we have in a wrong uh, relationship for that long. Um, there's no doubt about that. But I want uh, Ms. Thelma and Susan and uh, Angel's dad and her bro- and her brothers and, and sisters and nieces to know that I did not harm their daughter. How many times, Harry, does something have to happen over and over and over again before anyone does anything? What know. do you do? Wait, wait until somebody comes in and we have a Trayvon Martin case or O.J. French case and it costs the city and the uh, county tens of millions of dollars because of the negligence and because of this consistent, consistently, no accountability, no transparency, and covering their own tracks by the use of immunity and the major crimes division. So It is going to catch up with them. Okay, so let's talk about controlling the narrative. So what do you know about this case? Not what I've not the not the things that I've told you about it, but I mean, if you were just a member of the public, Forrest Bullen, the Stockton man charged with shooting and seriously wounding Bowen County Deputy Corporal Michael Walker, is set to be sentenced in Mobile Federal Court next week. Guess what he was? Guess what he was prosecuted for in federal court? 
Guns, probably. Guns no. and drugs. What? It, both, the Steve Nodine thing. Yeah. He was a drug user allegedly in possession of a bunch of firearms, right? Yeah. He faces a maximum of 10 years. So guess how many years he got? How many? 10. Got the max. Right. So um, what else do you think you know about that trial? Uh, if that's the same one I'm thinking about, that's when they rolled up on his house at night after he had gotten a threatening call with no lights on, no nothing else, and escalated into uh, a gunfire from the sheriff's department as well as from him. Plus, but he was def- he was in his home. Bond. Deputy in Baldwin County. Today, the suspect arrested in the case appeared in court for the first time. We also learned that Corporal Mike Walker has been released from USA Medical Center. He was hit by a shotgun blast in the face and chest. News 5's Ashley Knight joins us live in Baldwin County. And Ashley, you attended the bond hearing for Forrest Bullen today. That's right. Now, Assistant District Attorney Teresa Hines requested no bond for Forrest Bullen today. However, the judge felt he had to issue some kind of bond, but made sure it was high. 37-year-old Forrest Bolin was given a $1 million bond for the charge of attempted murder, plus a $500,000 bond for assault first degree. Both charges relating to the shooting of Corporal Michael Walker. Walker was shot Tuesday morning while responding to a residence after reports that Bolin pushed his girlfriend out of his vehicle while driving along Highway 59. She is in fair condition tonight, and Walker is said to be in good spirits and doing well. Even though the bond has been set extremely high, Assistant District Attorney Teresa Hines believes it could be higher. I don't think it's high enough. And when we have someone who has absolutely no regard for the law, um, no regard for the conditions that have been placed on him, and we have a a situation where a a sheriff's deputy, by the grace of God, is still with us. So I, I don't believe that it's unreasonable. I don't think it's high enough. Meanwhile, the domestic violence investigation will take some time. We basically do uh, like a timeline, if you will, on cases like that. So we're going back uh, days, really, on both uh, victim and suspect. Now, it will be some time before investigators get to interview uh, Corporal Walker and the victim of the domestic assault case. Uh, they want to give them some time to to heal both mentally and physically. Live in Fairhope, Ashley Knight, News 5. So, Paul, how many years do you reckon Forrest Bullen got for throwing his girlfriend off the bridge and all that other stuff? I don't know. How many? Uh, it was a bunch. I know that we, I know it added up. I know there was two radically different stories of the event. Ready to pay tribute as they laid in Sergeant Michael Walker, shot to the line of duty, will be honoring him during this presentation. During the early morning hours of December 19, 2017, Sergeant Mike Walker responded to a residence in the Tinsall community to investigate a serious domestic violence incident. <laughs> that had occurred earlier in the night. Upon arrival at the suspect's residence, Sergeant Walker began walking towards the rear of the residence as other deputies were monitoring the front. After turning the corner to the rear of the residence, Sergeant Walker was fired upon by the suspect. 28 shot fire, shot fire. But was able to find cover behind his vehicle. As the standoff continued, Sergeant Walker kept cover while monitoring his surroundings and giving the suspect commands. Unbeknownst to Sergeant Walker, the suspect had moved his position and fired at Sergeant Walker. Need I mention that this is pre-trial and this is at a public arena rodeo in Baymanette where the, you know, where the trials right. will take place? Okay. Yeah. 38, the body shot. Subject something to come around toward the back. Now they're playing audio from the nine one one transmissions, right? Y'all, you catching that, right? Sergeant Walker sustained several injuries from the shot, including complete blindness out of his left eye. 
Despite his injuries, Sergeant Walker continued to fight back, make it back to protect his deputies, and give clear directions and up-to-date details to dispatch. After removing himself from the scene to receive medical attention, Sergeant Walker was driven to an ambulance. While en route to the ambulance, Sergeant Walker demanded a radio and continued to give directions and orders to his men and other responding deputies despite being injured and away from the scene. Today, Sergeant Walker has been back on full duty for months as an investigator for the Sheriff's Office, despite losing the vision in his left eye. He continues to press the fight and has not let his injury slow him down. Controlling the narrative. All of work and anyone that knows him. That example is that no matter what life brings your way, keep your head, continue moving forward. With this situation, Sergeant Walker has represented himself, his family, his friends, and the Baldwin County Sheriff's Office with the utmost pride. It's a prime example of selflessness and the warrior spirit. Thank you, Mike, for your service and example. So you ready to see what really happens? Put your hands together. Controlling the narrative. Ninety-nine. You ever remember there being a back door? I've always met them at the front. Negative. I've been there one time and served on someone. So this is Forrest Bullen's house, and this is the uh, crime scene depicted you're going to be looking at a so there's three vehicles responding the only camera that's on is the center vehicle and you're going to be looking at you know it's a dash cam so it's a little fish eyed but one of the things i want you to notice is where this brass is located now michael walker is the only person besides the homeowner who fired his weapon the other two guys never fired around so all these shots you're going to hear the two times that Forrest shoots, I'm a, you, I'll stop and you'll see a little depiction on the screen of where the shots are coming from. But I wanted to set this up for you. They're going to come in here and and right along this side here where these pine trees are is a big red bluff, Paul. So this road kind of cuts through a hill right here. So if you were if if you were <laughs> abandoning your vehicles to go somewhere, why would you go into this kill box down here at the bottom of this hill? where there's a ravine on either side. I mean, there's just a lot of things about this that don't make sense, but I'm going to let you watch it for yourself. Plus, there were no lights on. Oh, well, and remember this. Nobody has a warrant. They didn't come up here with a warrant, or they didn't, you know, I represented this guy before. They could have called me and said, hey, man, we want to see your guy down here at 11 o'clock tonight, 2 o'clock in the morning, who knows what. But why would you go to the residence without your lights on, without announcing yourself, who knows? But watch what happens and watch how they control the narrative. Well, well, Harry, before you send it, also, he had had a phone call from the, uh, what was it, the boyfriend or whatever of the girl uh, that said that he was going to come over there and uh, kill him or come over there to uh, to uh, shoot him. Yeah. Well, so you'll, he had you'll... already got that call and he's inside of his own house. And then they, and then these cars roll up with no lights on. Well, it's the ex-husband of the girl that accused him ex-husband. of throwing okay. her off of a bridge and then going down to where she fell and getting her up and carrying her to medical attention. Anyway. All that was eliminated. Thing that makes any sense. So uh, anyway, this is Walker's vehicle here. And you'll notice that when he starts shooting, he's somewhere over here, but there's no brass over there. And that that's what I want you to just keep your eye on where he is and where all these shots are coming from because I can't, I never see him over here to account for any of this brass. And this vehicle never moves. Keith, how about you? You remember anything? I can't remember. Five years ago, last time I went to his house.
you say what he's been driving? Negative. Her car's still there. How would they know that? Supposedly. Supposedly still be there. I don't know what he was driving. He had an old Chevrolet truck at one time. I don't think he's got that anymore. Per the call notes from earlier, he was driving a white Ford Fusion. Yeah, that's our call. Which is right here in front of the front door. Temple. That's just what the call notes said. said that he was actually driving it, but I don't know. No lights on. Now let's see what really happened, Paul. That's one, two. This is the third vehicle. Now he's sitting in there with Bubba and Skeeters. Done called him and said they're gonna come cut his throat tonight. And three vehicles pull up with no lights on. Now check this Overhead. out. See the light over here on the left. That's mm -hmm. Walker. He's supposed to be covering the guy at the front door. What's he doing around at the back? Is that light over here? Yeah. The other guys ain't even out of the cars yet. That was Bullen shooting at him from his back door. Where he's approaching unannounced. Right. Walker. What's a nine or ten shots? Thirteen or fourteen. He doesn't know who's in that house. What tail's he shooting at? I don't hear anybody announcing anything, saying anything, nothing. This is what nobody did before. Overlay all this stuff. 911, what is your emergency? I got you guys shooting on my house on 63656 Highway 59. Hurry up. There's a bunch of them. Okay. Okay. All right. Listen to me. Listen to me. You're at 63656 State Highway 59? Yeah, please hurry. Please hurry. Okay. Hold on one second. I'm going to put you through to the police, okay? Do you know if anyone's injured? I don't know. I shot back. Okay. That's him calling the 911. You hear that, shoot? Can you hear that? Yes, sir. I'm putting you through the sheriff's office, okay? Sheriff's office. 911 transfers. Come here for shots fired at 636 State Highway 59. Caller, go ahead. Hurry up. I need some good shit. He's here now. They're shooting up my house, man. What's your name? Forrest. Forrest Bullock. Please hurry. Where are they at? Where are you at, Forrest? I'm in my house. Upstairs. You're in your house? Yeah. Thirty eight. Thirty Walker. You said Walt the City America again? I'm sorry. Walt the City America again? Six three six five six. Six three six five six to US Highway fifty nine? Yes. Okay. And we don't know what's going on? No, these are just being shots fired, still being fired. They're trying to make contact with that assault guy from Little River earlier. Oh, uh, from that female? Yes. Okay, hon. We'll get them. Well, you want them to stage until you tell me staying secure? Yes, please. Okay, honey. Thank you. You're welcome, Mike. Bye. 
shots go fire. Five shots go fire. Ten four. If I shot five. Ten four. Thirty eight. Nobody shot. Subject saw me come around toward the back. Fired around. Shots have been fired back. So right here, the police department, the 911 dispatcher, and also the sheriff's department dispatcher had an opportunity to tell him those are the police at his residence. They also have the opportunity to turn their lights on at any point or to say, it's the police, right? Yeah, because he's calling them for help. Okay, well, I'm just making sure you're keeping up here, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Now, where did this dash cam come from? The defense. Like I said, his trial's over. Yeah. He got 60 years for attempted oh. murder of Michael Walker. Listen. Good God. Listen, farce, farce. Come out here, all that kind of stuff. Never hear law enforcement or sheriff's department. My God, why would they not have their lights on and have identified themselves? That can't be protocol, man. I mean, it just makes no sense. Man, See Walker over here again? His light? Yeah. Well, you sure ain't trying to kill nobody with a 20 gauge and bird shot. Michael's down, Michael's down, Michael's down. Motherfuck, come on. Baby, I don't know what happened. I don't know if he shot me or what. Come on, send me a man unit, boys. I don't know. I don't know if he's dead. Come on. Somebody help me. We're up to about 20 rounds now. Why in the hell don't they turn the lights on? 911, what's your emergency? I think some deputies over here, man. Shooting where? Okay, hold on. I'm going to let you talk to him, okay? God. What confusion. No, well, once you're in, sorry, go ahead, caller. I need to talk to the deputy now. I- I'm sorry, sir. Hey, what's that? As far as I got some boys shooting at me, man, at my house. You're there at your house? I'm All right. What? All right, boys. What's your good telephone number for you? Uh, Four two one thirty six. What? Eight zero three six. I'm sorry. Get it to me one more time. Okay. Do you know who it is? It's 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 like a a damn Laurel and Hardy movie, isn't it? Man, Except really? You think how shot. did that, the hell shit like this happen? Okay. Well, just, let's just keep going here. Give me your number again, sir. I can't hear you over the gunfire. Yeah. Who was it? 
uh, Scooter Watson, a student named Chris Watson, and I think Bubba G is out there. And, and why do you think that they're out there? I don't know. They just shoot at me. Where's the deputy? Uh, okay, 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 listen. Um, listen. Put put your gun down and hold on. Hold on a second. I, have, I have a deputy right up the road. Hold on just a moment. What the hell is he shooting at? Who knows? He's gone. He's gone. If you put your PTSD. gun down. Yeah. Just down. You hear me? I hear you. Hold on just a second. Sounds like the operators are totally confused as to what the hell is no, going on. I, I, hold on for me just a second, Forrest. <laughs> Forrest, those are the deputies there at your house. 13 minutes, 52 seconds. They are there at your, yes, out there at 63656 Highway 59. Those are deputies. Put your gun down. It, it, it's deputies, so do not shoot again. They're out there checking your residence for you. Bullshit, they were calling me out there. I'm sorry? They told me to come out there. They were going to fuck me up. Who's going to pick you up? Whoever it was. I, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I have deputies up there at your residence checking it out. They are there at your residence. Six three six five six Highway fifty nine. Because you shot out at them. I was threatened. I was being threatened. Okay. Well, can you put your gun down for me? Yeah. Okay. Where's your gun at right now? On the floor. It's on the floor. Okay. So now, where are you at inside the residence? Scared, man. Uh, okay, Forrest, where are you at inside the residence? I'm in the, I'm in the hallway. You're in the I'm hallway. The... Is anybody else there with you at the house? <laughs> no. Nobody else, okay. Never asked that till then. Now, okay, well, what kind of gun do you have? Uh, it, it's a, I had a shotgun, but I... So, Paul, I'm going to tell you something that's going to be very unpopular. Um, I've hunted with Forrest. He hunts. He's a cousin of mine through the Slaughter family. And, uh, Forrest had any number of high powered rifles and other things in the house that night. And if he wanted to kill Scooter and Bubba and whoever he thought was out there, he, he certainly could have, but what did he do? He shoots, he shoots at him with an over and under shotgun with, Loaded for turkey, twenty gauge. Uh, oh, I I think that's right. Uh, I know it, I I know it was a shotgun, and I know it was loaded loaded for turkey. So I'm assuming, unless you just want to have turkey hamburger, <laughs> don't shoot them with a twelve gauge. At what so, point do they turn their damn lights on? They never. Paul, I'll let we can sit here and watch the whole thing if you want. No, I don't want to watch okay. it all. Oh, I guess this went to major crimes too. I don't even know. Yeah, well, I mean, okay. They just keep on on the phone with him. They've abandoned these vehicles are sitting in his yard with like flashbang grenades, and I don't know if you heard all that crunching noise right before the shot, but that yeah. was the deputy in this car. You know, they have those plexiglass partitions between the front and back seats. Well, mm -hmm. that's where their combat rifle is. And he couldn't get the damn thing out. So you kept hearing all that crunching noise from the audio in the car. That's him trying to get his weapon out. And all this hell's cutting loose. Hell, Walker got shot before he got his, his weapon out, right? Crazy. Man, oh, man, so then they, oh, man. So then they just keep him. the hell? So then they keep him on the phone, and then we're not going to show this stuff, but there, there's the interview of, you know, Walker trying to describe where he he couldn't remember where he's standing when all this stuff happens and whatever else and I I don't want to get into any kind of issue with divulging anything I'm not supposed to but let's watch this they beat it was supposed to be the arrest of a domestic violence suspect Forrest Bullen it ended the 
Except they didn't have a warrant for his arrest. So how could it supposed to have been an arrest, Paul? I don't know. False reporting. <laughs> okay, well, what if I told you that the girlfriend got on the stand and said that she was drunk and high and fell off the bridge and that he helped her? And he still got convicted of attempted murder of her. So, with a deputy being shot in the face with a shotgun oh my God. and a four-hour standoff. He had no idea it was an officer. He certainly wouldn't have shot an officer. But that's exactly what investigators say he did last month as deputies approached his house near Stockton on a domestic violence call. There will be no question left in anyone's eyes that he knew exactly what he was doing when he was shooting. Okay, so that's Teresa Hines, our chief nutcutter DA, right? She prosecutes yeah. murders and rapes and all the bad stuff, right? She's our ace. Yeah. So they get in there in front of Judge Bishop. And and this is all in the trial transcript. I'm not making any of this crap up. I'll publish a copy of it if if I if I can get my hands on it again. But basically, she gets up there and she says, "Judge," I that she asked for a sidebar and she says, "Judge, we'd like to introduce evidence that Forrest was in our secret database of bad guys we call the Master Name Index." Mm. Oh and boy. And not we're, now we're not trying to say that he's a bad guy. We're just trying to we're trying to I need to be able to explain to the jury why they would show up without a warrant, without their lights on, and without announcing themselves as law enforcement. And Bishop goes, "Well, I was kind of wondering how you're going to do that myself." So anyway, he allows them in violation of the rules of evidence, Rule Four Hundred Four B. Let me give you an example. If O.J. stole Paul Ripp's cigarette lighter, <laughs> we can't go into court as the prosecutor and say, well, hell, it's O.J. He cut, that, he cut his ex-wife's head off and he beat the shit out of those guys in Vegas and stole all his property back. You can't bring any of that stuff up. All we can do is talk about how O.J. stole your lighter. You see what I mean? Yeah. Not Prior bad acts are not allowed. So their explanation for showing up at his house without their lights on is they had a, a list of things that he had done and he uh, information from confidential informants for the drug task force that said he made threats against law enforcement and all this kind of rigmarole that was led into evidence. Uh, I wonder who all's on that list, Harry. I'm sure you and I are. (laughs) But listen to this. As three deputies approached, as soon as Corporal Mike Walker spotted him, a shot rang out. Walker yells to Bullen to come out with his hands up. He says it doesn't have to go this way. Five minutes later, and from an upstairs bedroom window, a second blast from the shotgun, and it hits Walker in the face. Forrest was of the opinion that there was a verifiable threat coming to him, and he he thought that he acted appropriately. Defense attorney Bucky Thomas says Bullen had received death threats after he allegedly threw his girlfriend off a bridge earlier that evening, severely injuring her. The case now goes to a grand jury. No dates have been set yet. My for God. Trial. On the Baldwin County Beat in Bay Manet, Debbie Williams, News 5. Man, it goes sideways. It just goes sideways, doesn't it? Shot wound, but still cannot see out of his left eye. Sheriff Hosmack says more surgery is scheduled, and there is hope his sight can be restored. He is still blind in his left eye. Uh, the surgery that is going to be done is in hopes to restore a, a portion, or if not all, of the sight in that eye. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we won't know until that surgery uh, the full length or the extent of the long-term injury to the eye. And that surgery is scheduled for later this month. First. Yeah, he's been in jail some two years for shooting a Baldwin County Sheriff deputy. And today, Forrest Bullen finding out he's going to be staying there a lot longer. Two guilty verdicts handed down this afternoon by a jury. Our Lee Peck joining us now with details. And Lee, the Baldwin County District Attorney's Office hopes this verdict sends a strong message. Well, they do, Byron and Lenise. The jury deliberating for about two hours before reaching its decision, wrapping up a case going on two years. It was December 2017. Baldwin County Sheriff's Deputy Sergeant Michael Walker shot in the face and chest responding to a domestic violence call. 39-year-old Forrest Bull... Is that true? No. No warrant. No, 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 nothing. The girls in the hospital, they weren't responding to anything. 
Copeland, the man who pulled the trigger, convicted today. A jury sending back a guilty verdict for attempted murder. Baldwin County Assistant District Attorney Teresa Hines pleased with the jury's decision. You know, anytime you have a case like this, which involves a member of law enforcement being shot and injured, um, it's one of those things that stays with you and stays with the community until there's a resolution. Bullen also found guilty of domestic violence first degree. It's what got Sergeant Walker and two other deputies out to Bullen's house. Investigators say he pushed his girlfriend off a bridge earlier that same night. The verdict is a win for Sergeant Walker, who along with other Baldwin deputies inside the courtroom are on the front lines every day. You know, the, the thing about it is, is that some of the most dangerous situations that our law enforcement officers go to are domestic violence situations. And that is what these officers were responding to. And, you know, I hope the message is sent that anytime anybody comes onto your property, that is not free reign to go shooting at anybody and everybody that comes onto your property. There has to be a viable threat. And in this case, there just wasn't. Bullen faces 10 years to life on both charges. That's in addition to the 10 years he was sentenced to last month on federal gun charges relating to this case. Meanwhile, Judge Jody Bishop set sentencing for August 22nd. Live in the newsroom tonight, Lee Pack, Fox 10 News. Well, Mr. Rip. Well, I don't know what to say. You're into this, you know, one hour, 40 minutes. (laughs) I know. I could, we could we could just keep on and on and on and on, but I'm not going to. Um, so I believe that drug uh, that is a drug that she used to get high with. Remember that was Wilter slandering right, uh, the, right. the dead boy on Jonathan Victor's case. We right, got, we got the Lone Ranger Chief Justice uh, Tom Parker. If y'all want to know all about the underlying case of why you can't get your hands on body cam footage anymore, go go watch podcast number one hundred two, Open Records Act. Um, here's a case that you're not going to hear about anywhere because only this young man's family really ever cared anything about the case. I'm afraid. Um, but this is the case that I decided to uh, burn my practice and reputation to the ground over because I accused the Bowen County Sheriff's Office of lying to everybody. Because I can tell you this, whatever happened to Peyton Little is not what the Bowen County Sheriff's Department said. He's probably the only person in the United States that ever strangled himself with a seatbelt, and they said that he was dragged by the car well, the seatbelts are designed to where you cannot be outside the car and drag. You don't have that much latitude with the strap. Okay, well, it turns out that, I, you know, I got the, the deputy who was assigned to investigate his death in a deposition, and I and I got him to read this into the record, and I said, now what besides the date and time and the age of the victim, is any of this true? And he said, you know, based on the physical evidence and in your interviews. And he said, no, sir, I don't, I don't believe any of it is. So you tell me, Paul, um, are they, did they control the narrative on this one? And let me tell you what's very important about this. When I deposed this deputy, I asked this investigator, I asked him, I said, did anybody ever tell you that Peyton Little was a confidential informant for the Baldwin County Sheriff's Department Drug Task Force? And he said, absolutely not, no way. So I subpoenaed that file. I cannot tell you what was in that file because I signed a confidentiality agreement, and they didn't let me see the contents anyway. But I can tell you he was a confidential informant, and according to uh, sources that were remain confidential, um, his handler was none other than chief of police currently in Baymanette, Al Tolbert. Who of course and that and that uh, who ascended for mediocrity as a corporal in the sheriff's department, but a good friend of the DA and of course a uh, utility player for the sheriff. Anything he needs done, he know he he knows he can depend on. And uh, this was declared a suicide almost immediately, wasn't it? Well, they they didn't even secure the scene. They moved the the vehicle was in the middle of the road at an angle and they didn't stop traffic both ways. They moved the car out of the road. The person driving the car 
They let her mother take her to the hospital, and they didn't interview her for a fortnight. Jesus Christ. Man. After they'd already put out the official statement that said he wrapped a seatbelt around his neck and jumped out of a moving car. So we have, let's see, Peyton Little. Then we have the five people that were killed on I-10. Then we have uh, Jonathan Victor. So that's, uh, let's see, five, six, seven. Then we have Mr. Yates, which is eight. Now we have O.J. French, which is nine. And we've yet to see any accountability whatsoever. And then you got a piece of crap like McSherry in Fairhope. Okay. Domestic violence. Okay. Remember, we're talking about domestic violence. We sent those police officers out there for domestic violence. Well, this guy has been picked up nine times, and he's still not in jail. And he's and and all of this. Remember, Paul. Remember the video. We yeah. know what happened. We don't need some judge to tell us what happened. Except the judge said that he didn't. You know uh, that we we couldn't get to this point because the paperwork was screwed up. Right. So then we have another case where the mayor of Spanish Fort slaps this woman, and I didn't—I don't want to watch the whole video, but this is him. No. That, that's his arm going back, and then the next frame, you know, it's it's about a half a second off. Um, you know, he's doing a follow through on the slap, but, but Judge Reed said I couldn't definitively say that there was a slap. Yeah, Reed didn't have his damn glasses on. Then we got no dine. Just over and over and well, over then, again, people. Where you know, you saw what happened. You saw what happened. Now, how did they convict this guy who was sitting at his own house, waiting on people to come hurt him? And he's calling the police. And he's calling the cops. Now they, I, the boy, they controlled that narrative, didn't they? They're outside shooting at him. Oh my god. Well, that's all I want to talk about this time. I think we, we, I think the dam is broken on this, and uh, right, you know, I could, we, we could sit here and watch just hours and hours of, of video of uh, exactly how these guys operate. But what would it would be cumulative and and potentially obscene? Well, well it's not going to surprise me at all if the. Uh, if the OJ French trial in Baymanette or that issue is not going to be the unwinding of the way that they've been doing business. I sure hope it is because there's no accountability, transparency, videos or anything coming from the sheriff's department until something, something changes. People aren't going to have confidence in them either. Well, and I can tell you this, um, the, <laughs> There's going to be a contingent again at the Baymanette City Council meeting tomorrow night. I will be there. I'll have the ye old GoPro and uh, hopefully give you some perspective uh, from the public's perspective of what's going on because I can tell you. And maybe, major, the, maybe the county commission too, so, Tuesday. So, so, so this independent major crimes unit that's investigating the shooting death of O.J. French um, is chaired – by the chief of police in Baymanette, <laughs> Al Talbert, who I just told you was the handler for the boy that stringed himself with a seatbelt. Oh, and he failed to mention to oh. the guy investigating the young man's death that, oh, by the way, he's one of my snitches, and here's the 30 people he's been informing on that you might want to call on to see if maybe, maybe they strangled him with a seatbelt and this girl ain't telling the truth. Just maybe. God almighty. Mm, mm, mm. Where anyway, are you, FBI? Where are you, some damn buddy, some authority? And so next week, we'll talk all about Dothan <laughs> and the Queen <laughs> dying and all these other important things that have happened. But we right. had to get this one okay. out, and we appreciate everybody sticking with us. I know this was a long one, but, hell, that, that felt pretty good to me. I need to say uh, one more thing real quick. Before we get out of here, no representation is made that the quality of legal services to be performed are greater than the legal services provided by other lawyers. I'm Harry Still. This is the Backstory Podcast. I have my friend and client, Mr. Paul Rip, with me today. How are you, Mr. Rip? Very good. And I like to say the Rip Report is a not for profit organization looking at political corruption and things like this with the police. 
And uh, unfortunately, in Baldwin County, it's very easy to find. And I can't find a seconder usually when I propose this, but I don't care. I don't need a seconder. My own opinion is enough for me, and I claim the right to have it defended against any consensus, any majority, anywhere, any place, any time. And anyone who disagrees with this can pick a number, get online, and kiss my ass.